Thank you again, Congressman Arrington, for joining us. I am now joined by his counterpart, Congressman Brendan Boyle, ranking member of the Budget Committee and a Democrat from Pennsylvania. Welcome, Congressman. Great to be with you. Well, just as I start off uh, with the chairman, I talked to, about his agenda for the rest of the year. Do want to get to what's going to happen in 2025, but as the top Democrat on the Budget Committee, what are you working on now uh, at the committee level? Well, you know, it is interesting. Uh, 2025, which I know we're going to talk about in, in a little bit, is going to be such a once in a decade opportunity to impact uh, tax and fiscal policy that actually in order to prepare for that, some of what we're focusing on now on the Democratic side is th doing the preparation work so we're ready to hit the ground running in January 2025. I've been convening uh, a number of meetings and sort of uh, informational educational roundtables for my Democratic colleagues on the committee to talk about all that will be expiring as set by law uh, come 2025. It, it really will be, again, a, a once in a decade opportunity. So the work for that doesn't begin in 2025. It actually, a bit of it begins right now. In addition to that, however, um, I've really been focusing on uh, my time on attempting to get the word out about how strong this economy is, just how uh, we have really kind of led the field by a great deal when you look at U.S. economic growth compared to all of our peer nations in the West, when you compare the fact that inflation is far lower in the U.S. than, again, all of our peers, what is it about the U.S. economy that has made it by far number one in the world, uh, and that gap between us and everyone else is actually accelerating it? So I think it's important to understand what brought that about? It didn't happen by accident. And what lessons can we learn that then can be applied for the conversations that are happening about 2025 and the rest of the next decade? Well, let's let's break that down a little bit, uh, because as you mentioned, there are some very good indicators, uh, whether that's unemployment, uh, the stock market as well, even though I know that's not a, a key indicator of everybody's uh, well, well offness. But um, why is this disconnect between uh, the economy and some of the signs uh, and, and and polls showing that people are just not feeling it. What, what's your take on that? Yeah, so first, it's not totally uncommon, this disconnect. Uh, we've seen in past economic recoveries that public mood tends to be a bit of a lagging indicator, um, that it takes a while for it to, to kind of seep in. I also think, though, that we, we have to take a step back and realize this is not just a U.S. phenomenon that if you look at Canada, UK, France, Germany, et cetera, we see a lot of discontent out there and we have to recognize it. And we can't uh, you know, tell people how to feel. Mm -hmm. They're going to feel based on their own life's experiences. And I think that you know, when you look at all those countries I just mentioned, some of them have left of center governments, some of them have right of center governments, but all of them experienced the same thing. And that was the once in a century pandemic. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that we have been in a essentially a low grade depression, um, not an economic depression, but a, a, a more you know general one in terms of mood, really since the spring of, of 2020. Here in the United States, we have a million and a half fewer Americans than, than we did uh, back then because of people we lost to the pandemic. So I think that we need to acknowledge we all went through a very traumatic time. Um, and so it's understandable that people wouldn't necessarily be in a uh, party mood <laughs> so quickly after what was, you know, for many of us, perhaps the most difficult thing we'll ever experience. Now, obviously, it's, it's better to be in the majority than in the minority. You're in the minority now, but just barely. Uh, are you confident that uh, Democrats can win the House? Because as you know, the White House is a jump ball. Trump is, is ahead, but it's a jump ball. The Senate's looking more Republican just based on the map. Uh, what, what's your take on, on the House and the chances Democrats can regain the majority? I, I feel good about it. Look, I, this is, it's my observation that this is really the first election since the year 2000 in which you genuinely have the House, Senate, and White House, all three up for grabs. Yep. Now, in terms of you know, both chambers of Congress, the way I describe it is while both are up for grabs, I would say perhaps the Senate is playing on the home field of the Republicans, 
while the Demo while the House is playing on the home field of Democrats. And certainly geographically, uh, you can look at that where a lot of the seats that will determine which party is in the majority are in blue states and blue districts when it, it, you're talking about the House races, the most competitive ones. Whereas, you know, when it's the Senate, the, the seats and the states that will really determine which party controls the Senate, uh, they tend to be more red than blue, such as Ohio and Montana, uh, et cetera, and then, then a, a group of purple ones. So I have to say, as I sit here right now, five months ago, a lot can happen. Either side can win, but I would much rather be the Democratic side when it comes to control of the House uh, than the Republican side. Uh, when I was talking to Congressman Arrington, uh, I was mentioning of how it, it's the Budget Committee is is usually a very partisan committee, um, but but the the two of you really get along. Can you talk about your relationship uh, with the chairman and how it's evolved? Yeah, I, I've been friends with Jody for uh, quite a number of years now. In fact, last year, I guess two years ago, when we were both seeking to lead our respective uh, caucuses on the committee, uh, I remember saying to him in the well of the house, boy, wouldn't this be amazing if we both got this and we could serve, uh, serve al you know, alongside each other as counterparts. Uh, so he is a genuine friend. I feel fortunate that he's in that position. I would prefer him to be ranking member uh, <laughs> and for me to be chair, but I am very fortunate that, that he is the lead Republican on the committee. We have a good, genuine friendship and have worked constructively. We do not always agree. In fact, I would say he's a principled West Texas conservative, and I'm a, a principled Pennsylvania Democrat. So we come from the two major different ideological traditions, uh, and yet we've been able to, to work together, and we do genuinely like each other. Um, I hope that from the first day, we've set a tone that has led the committee to, to work in a mutually respectful way. And I have to say it has been you know, personally gratifying that I've had members, both Democratic and Republican members come up to me and say that they have appreciated the way that Jody and I have worked together and how that tone has really followed through in terms of you know, how the committee has, has acted for the last year and a half. Yeah, and I think those are the stories that, that don't get out. There actually are bipartisan Absolutely. relationships in these yeah. polarizing times. Um, uh, when I was talking to the chairman, he, as you know, he's pushing a fiscal commission on debt that has moved out of the budget panel. Uh, did get a couple Democratic votes. Uh, I, I know you didn't vote for that, but what is your solution if you were to be chairman of, of, of getting our fiscal house in order and balancing the budget? Yeah, you know, I, I did vote against it, but as I said during those hearings, yeah, you know, the root of my opposition wasn't that I, you know, was wildly opposed to the idea or or think it's it's so awful. It's that the commission is essentially an unnecessary detour, because even if you have a commission the same way you had a couple commissions about 10, 15 years ago, it still comes back to the actual members of Congress who will have to put up the vote. Um, and make some pretty tough decisions. I would rather just get to that point um, and, and not go through an unnecessary detour. I am also legitimately, genuinely concerned that a commission can essentially just be a ruse for attempting to enforce pretty substantial devastating cuts to Social Security and Medicare, but do it in a sort of less obvious backdoor way. So those were the reasons for my opposition but to be clear, um, when it comes to Social Security, when it comes to Medicare, both of which will, um, if nothing else happens, will go insolvent in about a decade. Um, we also have deficits and debts that are projected to rise. So I, I recognize that we do have real challenges, not today, not tomorrow, but in the relatively near future that we need to deal with. Uh, I just think in the end of the day, it's gonna be members who are going to have to solve those problems not an independent commission. Do you think uh, when you talk about the debt, and it, it's amazing of how much the debt has piled up, certainly you mentioned COVID and that was that was part of it, uh, a lot of legislation, both bi uh, bipartisan and partisan, um, but that has really escalated the, the debt. Um, do you think Republicans are, are gonna be willing, because as you mentioned, you know, these programs need to be fixed. They need to be revamped in some capacity. Do you think the modern day Republican Party 
is going to agree to to raising taxes. As you know, Grover Norquist attacked uh, the chairman for this debt yeah. commission, uh, thinking, hey, this is just a way to raise taxes. Well, a couple of thoughts on this. First, I'm always very careful to make this point because I think there's a lot of confusion in the public. Social Security does not add one dime to our deficit or our federal debt. In fact, for a lot of years, Social Security actually kind of masked um, the, the size of the deficit we had because it always brought in more, uh, more people were paying into it than outlays or essentially monthly checks were going out. When it comes to Medicare and Medicaid, uh, Medicaid um, obviously funded a little bit differently. But for Medicare, it's basically the same philosophy as well. When we're talking about our deficit and our debt, those are uh, separate conversations from whether or not Social Security or Medicare will have enough revenue after the year 2034 to meet the rise in the population of retirees that will begin right around that time. Now, in terms of where the Republican Party is on the conversation of revenues, um, I'm glad that this question is raised because I, I go to great lengths to always bring this up during our hearings whenever there's a conversation about deficit and debt. We've had testimony in a number of hearings that have taken place this term of Congress that when we look at $34 trillion of debt, $10 trillion of that is missing tax revenue just from the year 2001 on. Because we had the George W. Bush tax cuts of 2001, which weren't paid for, the George W. Bush second uh, round of tax cuts in 2003 that weren't paid for, the extension of many of those tax cuts about a decade later, mm -hmm. combined with then the Trump um, tax cuts, most of which went to the richest 1% in 2017, when you add that up, again, we have had experts testify before the committee that all told, that's about $10 trillion of revenue that we would have had if we had done nothing uh, as opposed to those tax cuts that I just mentioned. So let's make sure we remember there are two sides of the spreadsheet. Yes, there is the spending side, but there is also the revenue side. And we are far lower today in revenues than we would have been uh, had we not taken those actions. And then finally, I'll say in terms of where the Republican Party is, I give Jody a lot of credit for being intellectually honest and saying that, you know, he, he I'm gonna paraphrase him, but he has said that for him, everything has to be on the table and that includes revenues. I think 10 years ago, that uh, wouldn't have been a tenable position within the Republican Party, which was very much about the Tea Party and the Grover Norquist pledge about not raising taxes. The Republican Party today, it, frankly, is much more about the social and cultural issues um, than it is about fiscal issues. I think that's one way, one of many ways that Trump has changed the party. So ironically, while there are many things Trump has brought about that I, I'm quite concerned about and, and uh, really oppose, Ironically, I think the, the Trumpification of the Republican Party and making it about all of those cultural issues has probably created a little bit more space for flexibility for Republicans today when it comes to uh, fiscal policy. Yeah, and that sets up the next question. As you know, and you've been working on preparing for next year, the Trump tax cuts do expire. Um, if if you are chairman, what do you think Democrats should do and what should Democrats learn from the extensions that you mentioned, you know, uh, on the Bush tax cuts uh, going forward? Uh, because if you are chairman, um, you know, the, you know in, it, you, Democrats could have everything, but they've got to win every close Senate race. But more likely, it's, it would probably be divided government. So how, how would that work? Yeah. So first, I mean, we talked earlier about how the House both sides could win it. The Senate, both sides could win it. The White House is a jump ball as well. So boy, you know, we're talking about literally six different scenarios there, uh, or I think actually eight, if I'm doing the math right, different uh, permutations in terms right. of what things could look like uh, after November. Um, you really need to know the answer to that question first before you can kind of talk about what will likely um, happen in, in 2025. I will be making the argument uh, that we do need more tax revenues, that the uh, so-called Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was so heavily tilted to the richest 
You know, it is the only tax cut, I believe, in the history of polling that had a higher disapproval rating than approval rating. That's pretty remarkable. Every previous tax cut, whether it was Ronald Reagan's or George W. Bush's, um, they were, you know, more popular than unpopular, not the TCJA, not the, the Trump tax cut. So making sure uh, that we recognize that we do need more revenues. Um, also, what I will be looking at is, you know, there were things that we passed out in the House in 2021 that then were not adopted by the Senate. I'll give you one example. The um, expansion of the um, child tax credit. Yep to help working poor families. Um, that reduced child poverty for one year in the United States, because it only existed for one year, that expansion. It reduced child poverty by 46%. Hmm. Just think about that. One piece of legislation, one policy change can reduce child poverty in the United States of America by almost half. That is something I feel very strongly about doing it. I think it's a tragedy that we didn't make it permanent when we had the opportunity. Revisiting that will be a major priority for me. I come from a district in which many people uh, would, cat would be classified as, as the working poor. Mm -hmm. I come from a working class uh, background myself, I'm pretty representative of, of the folks who I, I represent in, in Philly. And um, boy, so many people in my neighborhood would benefit uh, from doing that. I also think that you're going to see um, the conversation again, come back to what we need and can do on childcare. Um, that was something that was passed out of the house, but unfortunately was not passed the Senate. So I think it'll be a combination of looking at, you know, what things that were bipartisan or can be bipartisan that were in the TCJA and that perhaps could be somehow saved, what things need to go, especially those things that really cost a lot of tax revenue. And then can we use some of that to make critical investments that as a, current, as a country, we currently are not making? Uh, you mentioned your, your district. I'm interested in what your constituents are saying that maybe the White House could learn from. Obviously, the top of the ticket is so important. Pennsylvania, both for, for House and a big Senate race. And obviously, the presidentials, uh, you know, probably whoever wins Pennsylvania is, is, is likely to win. What, what would you like to see the White House maybe do more of or, or accentuate? So um, first, I am obviously a very biased individual when it comes to a conversation about Pennsylvania. But uh, uh, even taking that hat off, I can say quite confidently, Pennsylvania is the most important battleground state in the election. Um, we are the largest, if you accept that, and, and I do, and I think most people do, that really the the six biggest battleground states are the three in the north, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and the three in the Sun Belt, Georgia, Arizona, and Nevada. Pennsylvania is the biggest uh, of the six, and it's very hard to come up with a credible math that gets you to 270 for either candidate that doesn't include Pennsylvania's 19 electoral votes. So um, with that in mind, I have been very proud of the fact that this president has visited Pennsylvania more than any other president in my lifetime. Hmm. Uh, it's almost a running joke among my colleagues when they see, you know, I, I will get texts from colleagues, oh my goodness, Biden is back in your district again. Um, Politico has reported that actually, besides Delaware, President Biden has visited my district more than any other district uh, in the country. Hmm. So, you know, in 2016, if you remember, Hillary Clinton was fairly or not, was faulted for not going to Wisconsin and right. not going as often to Michigan and Pennsylvania. No one can fault this president and this White House. He has paid attention to Pennsylvania um, incredibly more than, as I said, any other previous president in my lifetime. So I think continuing, as he's been doing, to show up, continuing to focus on middle-class economics and blue-collar econ uh, economics, Reminding people because, you know, we're in a very fractured media environment and polls continue to show that, believe it or not, people don't necessarily know about what the bipartisan infrastructure bill did, what we did uh, in 2021 in terms of the American Rescue Plan. You know, I, I, as I've said many times before, it's not an accident that the United States of America is leading the world by far when it comes to the economic recovery since the pandemic. 
That is because of actions this White House took along with a Democratic majority in Congress. We have to continue to get that word out. It is more difficult now than at any point in the last 70, 80 years to get people's attention and to keep that attention. So I think it just shows you we have to be even more repetitive than in a previous era. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism of uh, the Biden policies on immigration. A lot of members I've talked to on both sides of the aisle say they hear it from their constituents. Are you satisfied with what uh, uh, Biden has done administratively? Obviously, there was a, a bipartisan deal that fell apart in the Senate, most, mostly because uh, former President Donald Trump did not want Congress to, to act on it and the Republicans backed away. Uh, but that is, that is an advantage Republicans have, and it's not just border states. I, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. yeah look, the, the border um, issue is a real issue. Uh, essentially, we've been dealing with a spike at the southern border really since 2005. That's when I recall this, this issue first really uh, rising kind of to the top of the agenda. If you recall, that's when George W. Bush was attempting to work out a bipartisan deal yep. with Ted Kennedy and with John McCain. It wasn't solved then. Um, and so we've been dealing with this now really for, for two decades. It did not start with President Biden. Um, so that is, that is uh, incorrect when Republicans push that narrative. That said, there is no question, it is a very serious issue that needs to be dealt with. Now, the best way to deal with it would have been the legislation, the bipartisan legislation um, that was being worked on and and that was being forwarded, you had conservative Republican James Lankford leading the charge on the Republican side. You had Republican leadership in the Senate for it. But then what happened is Donald Trump ordered his Republican lieutenants in Congress to kill it because Trump wanted the issue rather than solving the problem. And don't take my word for it. Mitt Romney, uh, Mitch McConnell, and other Senate Republicans have flat out said in public exactly what I just said, that the reason why we don't have a bipartisan immigration bill signed into law today is because Trump did not want it and wanted to kill it. So um, I support the president doing whatever he can independent of Congress, knowing that unfortunately we don't have a majority of Republicans willing to work with us in good faith to attempt to solve this problem for the American people. I was doing a, a TV spot with former Congressman Mick Mulvaney and uh, former uh, Chief of Staff of the White House, and he said this election is about three I's, inflation, uh, Israel, and immigration. Obviously, that's from the Republican standpoint. Inflation is obviously a big issue. Uh, I pointed out, though, there's a big A word that wasn't in, in that uh, those three words, and that's abortion. How much should Democrats be talking about abortion down the stretch of this election? Well, I'm smiling because Mick is actually a, a very good friend. I was texting with him uh, earlier. Uh, I, I always uh, get a kick out of when he uh, invokes my name, you know, sometimes to, in a good natured way, take a shot. Um, but uh, one of, you know, one of the brightest members who was here, I probably did not agree with him on, on pretty much anything. Right. Um, but it is a reminder that, as you pointed out before, we actually do have more bipartisan friendships and relationships on the Hill than people realize. The problem is that uh, what gets covered, unfortunately, tends to be, you know, the people who are saying the most incendiary or really hateful things. It just doesn't attract as much attention if you have a conservative Republican and proud Democrat um, actually saying, you know, good things uh, about uh, one another. Now, continuing on this theme, I strongly disagree with what Mick Mulvaney uh, <laughs> said in, in terms of the three eyes. I have no doubt that he wishes. <laughs> That's what the election uh, right. would be about. But as you pointed out, one of the major issues that will be, well, before we even project forward about 2024, we know that one of the major issues in just the last election in 2022 was abortion. Um, really, the dynamic change in June of 2022, once the Dobbs decision came down. And since then, I have been struck um, by just how much the abortion issue has impacted election after election. In Pennsylvania, we won a Senate race by four to five points that was supposed to be 50-50. We won a governor's race by double digits. We shockingly won the majority in the state house for the first time since my first election in 2008. And no one saw that coming. And by far the biggest issue was the um, Dobbs decision 
and the Republican desire to have a national abortion ban. And let me be clear, I, I'm not engaging in hysteria. I genuinely 100% am convinced that if Donald Trump wins, uh, that means probably there's a Republican trifecta um, in Washington, and that will mean a national abortion ban. I, I don't think there's really any doubt about that. Uh, the only people who deny that reality are the same people who are saying that Roe would never be overturned uh, in the first place. So I wouldn't exactly, you know, uh, say that they have very high credibility on this issue. So I think that uh, the fact that Republicans still don't have a good answer on abortion, they continue to still uh, push very extreme, unpopular measures. I only think that it will hurt them, especially in states like Pennsylvania. Uh, last question, Congressman. Uh, it's such a charged political environment. We have the, the legal cases with Hunter Biden and Donald Trump. And obviously, we had January 6th. Uh, are you concerned about violence uh, around the election, whether it's before or afterward? I am continue. Uh, I continue to be concerned about violence. I experienced uh, January 6th. Uh, if you had asked me in the months and years before that, did I ever think in the United States of America I would see a day like January 6th, I would have probably naively said no. Mm -hmm. The reality is, um, Frankly, ever since Donald Trump has been on the scene, the number of threats and the overall vitriol has gone up exponentially. Um, I have seen just in the last couple of years, uh, the U.S. Capitol Police authorized some things that you never even would have thought about before Trump and before the sort of um, violent rhetoric that he too often engages in. So it is a real concern. And I got to tell you, it's not just me. When I'm abroad, I was recently at the 80th anniversary of D-Day in Normandy, an incredibly moving ceremony. I had the opportunity to speak to a number of D-Day veterans who are just remarkable people. I mean, they're all in their late 90s or even over 100 now. The level of concern among our allies about where the U.S. is headed when it comes to the erosion of democracy, when it comes to uh, the rise of violence, politically motivated violence. People are concerned around the world about the future trajectory of the United States. And in my view, uh, I believe Donald Trump in a close election will ultimately be defeated this November. And I think one of the major reasons why will be a number of independent and even center-right voters turn against electing someone as dangerous as Donald Trump. Well, it's certainly looking like it's going to be a, a tight election in, in many races. We may not even know who controls uh, the White House, the House and Senate for, for a few days. Uh, as you know, Congressman, the, the House sometimes can take uh, a week or so in certain, yeah. certain races. But let's, let's all hope for, for no violence uh, this fall. Thank you, Congressman Boyle, for joining us. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Boyle, and thank you to our viewers and to the 92nd Street Y for their collaboration. If you missed any portion of today's discussion, the full event video is available on thehill.com and the 92nd Street Y website. Thank you very much. I'm Bob Cusack. Have a great evening.